Welcome, ladies, to week three of our beautiful scripture conference study group called Step Into Your Purpose. So excited that you are back for more, especially while everybody is home and it's still COVID and you're kind of getting tired of it, kind of done with it. And that means there's still a lot of stimulation and things going on and you're still making time for you and your spiritual potential that we just talked about and fulfilling that, fulfilling your mission and co-mission, just like Sister Nelson talked about, that you are making time for that. And that is only going to bless your life and your family's life. So this is an hour well spent, I can promise you. So we were just talking a little bit about what we had experienced so far. We've been building on the first two weeks, which is to find your purpose, trying to help you with that sweet spot and Venn diagram, trying to help you figure out what is my purpose. And then the next week we worked on increasing spiritual capacity so that we can have a better ability to feel and recognize the spirit, giving us those divine downloads of what we personally are to do and how we're to fulfill our personal purpose at the different stages of our lives. Because we talked about there's different purposes that we fulfill at different times. And sometimes there's just that core driver that is, is just constant. Maybe you're always the organist or whatever, but there's different purposes. And as we listen to the spirit, we'll be able to know what we're to do and when we're to do it and how we're to best do it. Not that he gives us a playbook. Wouldn't we love that? I know I would, but he gives us this, I call it the breadcrumbs. He gives us little breadcrumbs and those post-it notes to lead us to the thing that we need. So I love that. I love the learning that we've had so far. This week and this topic today, our two talks are on women who can. Remember in a plea to my sisters that President Nelson says, we need women who can. And then he gave a whole bunch of different traits and abilities and all of the characteristics, things that we can do and become so that we can be more effective as an instrument in his hand. So I am so excited. If you haven't had the download, go ahead and get the link on the side and then you can get that download and that we can go over that at the end. But I would love for you to just, we're just gonna jump in. We're gonna start with the two talks are for such a time as this from Wendy Watson Nelson. And now they just like her to be called Wendy Nelson, Sister Wendy Nelson and a plea to my sisters from President Nelson part two, because we went over it a little bit that first week, but it was so, 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 so good. So we, um, we want to go through and get the specifics so that we're making sure that we are picking out the things that he wants us to pick out and that we're not missing anything and that we're, we're getting the divine downloads that are more specific to who we are and what our particular potential might be. So let's start with the juicy, juicy for such a time as this. Did anybody else feel like this was just packed, jam-packed with goodies? Anybody else? Did you just like... I mean, it's ridiculous. I'm going through and I've got like, just like you, like these circles and underlines and then go back and more underline and, and paragraphs and pull them out and they could be like 6,000 memes in here. Yeah, so, so juicy. So I know, I know there's so much that we could talk about here, but what I wanted to just, I'll start us off with something and then let's just rock and roll and go for a good 30 juicy, maybe even 35, 40 minutes, just depending on what you guys want to share. But let's start with something from the very beginning. I love this. If you go into the first paragraphs, I love the second paragraph where she says, sisters, we are here in mortality now because we're supposed to be here now. And then we're to complete the mortal third line, the mortal assignments we were given pre-mortally and to which we agreed. So then step down to that first line in the quote of President Q. Cannon. God has chosen us out of the world and has given us a great mission. Okay, so what are those assignments? What are they? And what is that mission or commission that we've been given, right? So then we go down to every one of us. It starts the great mission to which President Cannon. Go to the last line of that paragraph. Note that he said, every one of us has had our part allotted to us. Now here's the sentence. So we get the buildup reminding us that we each have a mission to fulfill. Each one of us. Nobody gets out of that. We've all agreed to it. We received our mission call pre-mortally. What is it? And maybe probably several. What have we promised to do? Don't we want to know that since that's what we're getting tested on, right? So when we go down, I love this in order that paragraph, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, essentially paragraph in order to fulfill. If you see that in order to fulfill the wonderful mission for which we were sent to earth, we need to be prepared. I, that jumped right out at me, prepared. And then I put, how? How am I supposed to be prepared? 
with this. And then the next line, oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And that's what we're going to talk about today is skill and understanding. What are the skills we need? What is the understanding we need? What are those scary things we don't want to learn how to do or even face, whether they're emotional or they're physical or they're tangible or intangible or they're temporal, they're pragmatic, they're organizational, whatever those things are that we don't want to face, that's what we're going to have to face. That whole Lego movie, I don't want to do that. If anyone's seen the Lego movie and has kids, Batman, remember, he's like, I don't want to do that. And that's how we feel often. We just don't want that. But I had to go into my office over this last weekend and I'm like, am I going to get something done or not? Papers in stacks all over the floor because I had started organizing and then you know what happens? COVID happened. So I just had to leave it. And there's just nothing but papers and then birthdays happen. And then, you know, it's the abyss and, and wrapping paper gets thrown in there. And then surprise things get thrown in there because nobody goes in there. And I had to go and, and wade through it. I had to gird up my loins and put the armor on and go in and make a difference. And I was able to get it cleared out, but it, I didn't want to do it. But when we face those things, we don't want to do, man, he gives us the tools. He gives us the courage. He gives us the ability, but we got to do it. We got to start. We got to open the office. We got to open that door. We got to start that thing. We got to go for a walk. We got to do whatever it is we got to do to get started so that he's going to give us that skill and understanding. So I love that. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? And then we're just going to open it up to all the juicy, good things that you saw in here. Any thoughts on what you figured out your mission to be or what you're struggling with to find out your particular purpose and mission right now? And any thoughts on preparing and getting that skill and understanding to be able to do it? Are you asking, what is that skill and understanding? What is it that I need? These are the things I've figured out about that so far. Arusha, the Savior said that he came to earth to do the will of his Father who sent him. In like manner, we are here to do the will of our Father, that same Father who sent us. I must give all I have and am to God. I feel it. And there's no other way to true happiness. So we want to be happy. So true. Are you guys feeling this? This When she says it like several pages back, was it page five? Where she says, she talks about that woman and how she's feeling a sense of urgency. And do you remember that? And how she's feeling this urgency to do something. And she even said, this woman said almost in despair, I wonder if I even have a mission. And then she poured out her heart to the Lord and she listened in a different way and received a little corrective feedback from the Lord. She had been looking for her mission somewhere other than the situation in which he had pre presently placed her. And then the whisperings of the spirit, her mind was enlarged and her heart was changed and she was flooded with ideas, flooded. So consider if you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Maybe listen differently and maybe he's giving you some corrective feedback because we're here to share who we are and all we are in all the stages, not waiting for perfection. So I love that. Remember that I told you Sherry Dew, she was praying about what she should do and then she got the answer of turn off the TV. Do you guys remember that from one of her talks? And it, the, the thing she got was you have the TV on too much. And she said, I'm sad to say that my first response was, no, I don't, I don't have it on that much. Anybody responded like that before to a prompting? And she said, but then I kind of went back, took a step back and said, do I have it on a lot? And she said, being single, that she had, she ended up having the, the TV on for background noise, for sound noise. And she realized that that was becoming a distraction, but she would not have considered that. Anarchy and then Lamira. Thank you. So just listening to you um, and that thought about preparation and just some other things, those are some similar messages I feel like I've been hearing for myself um, the last few months. And I just, I just had this thought go through my mind of like, what's that work? He keeps saying to me, go to work, go to work. And I'm like, I don't know what the work is. And um, the thought came to me right now of how President Nelson just um, within the last couple of years said the greatest work, the greatest cause that we could be participating in right now is the gathering. And by listening to these events, I've, I've found my purpose as part of gathering. Like I have a gift, I think of gathering people and communicating with other people and just wanting to gather. And so this is just helping me to feel that, but I feel like we're all in that work. If the prophet has said the greatest cause, the greatest thing, the greatest work we could be doing right now is participating in the gathering, whatever that looks like for us individually, then at least that's a starting point for me to know, okay, it falls under that category. Now, what specifically am I supposed to be working on? 
I love that. And have you felt that with COVID that you are gathering and gathering and gathering again and, and in different unique ways and how it's stretching us. It's stretching our ability to think, how can we effectively gather? How can we gather for Mother's Day? Where I had a neighbor where they, the kids were taking, he said, it almost feels like by appointment only, where they were taking turns and they were coming at different time schedules, you know, so they could stagger. So it is about gathering. And I love that. His talk, Sisters and the Gathering of Israel, um, it's a conference talk. It's fabulous. It's the one where he challenged us to do that 10-day fast and read the Book of Mormon and underline about the Savior. If you get a chance, reread that because it's exactly right. We are fundamental in this gathering of Israel. And it's not just a name tag. We have to wrap our minds around this idea of we have what we need right now to start gathering Israel. And whether it's family history, whether it's our own family, whether it's um, members, non-members in our, in our family, people who aren't yet members of the church or not members of the church, it's just a gathering of good people and preparing their hearts to receive the good news of the gospel, whatever that feels and looks like to you and them. And that's, that's what we're to do. That's the most important thing. Okay, keep our children alive, feed them, clothe them, but then gather Israel, right? That's what we're to do. I love it. Somebody else. Oh, Lamira, do you have something you want to share, love? Yeah, I just, I, I was blown away by this talk and I read it before, but um, I, as I've been pairing this with reading the power, the women and the, the pre, the power of priesthood, power and women, the one by Barbara Gardner, I can't remember the name, yes. but that, that, and then I found another talk called for such a time as this, the time is now by Norma B. Ashton, but it's in a book. It's in this book from 20 it's from women's conference but i couldn't find it online and it's but it basically talks about loving right now and doing right now your mission and i feel like um sister nelson talked about that and pairing all those together i feel like i have embraced my motherhood and stepped into that even more now while i have this other mission i know i'm to do but i feel like i've been opening that revelation for my kids who've been, I've been like, okay, what do we do next? What's the thing? And like, I woke up this morning at four 30 and had this thought, you need to do this for this child that I've been thinking about for a while. And finally, that's what I did this morning. And we got something done, you know, but I feel like opening that has been, and just accepting that and go, this is where I am now. And guess what? It's beautiful and it's okay. And it's exhausting and it's tiring, but, but that's where we are. And I just feel like once I was able to embrace that, then cleaning my house isn't a chore anymore. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because I'm doing it because I'm bringing in, I'm bringing in the spirit in my home. And it, yeah, it's not that I don't love it, all the time, but does that make sense? It's just for a whole different purpose. It's like, it's new. I'm not complaining about the laundry anymore because it's like, no, that's, this is what we do. And it's good. Oh my goodness. I so, can you relate to that? Sometimes we think that this purpose is, it's gotta be big and global and it's gotta be something profound and it's gotta be something that we really dig to find. And oftentimes there are purposes in there that we need to dig and find. We need to ask follow-up questions to find, just like we were talking about last week. We need to, to, to figure out some of those other purposes that kind of lay dormant. But I love that you talked about motherhood and when we shift our lens, and see it through a purpose-filled lens, it does shift everything. I, really quickly, we just, for, we tried a home garden for three years in a row. Anybody tried square foot gardening? Okay, so we tried it for three years in a row and it was like getting everybody in and trying to do their thing and it just did not work. And then the deer came in and had a party after we had actual produce and it was so just debilitating. Anyway, so I could not go back to it. I had PS, PTSD about the whole garden thing. But with this COVID thing, again, I am embracing, I'm embracing this being at home and, and feeling this, I want to talk about it later, but living a beautiful life as a mother, like not just, you know, when before COVID, did anybody else feel like it was get here and get there and do this and get dinner and get them homework and get here. And it was so pounding. I just felt jarred all the time. And now we had a discussion about this. We don't have to live like that anymore, especially right now. We can pause, we can go for a walk. And guess what we're doing? We've started a garden. 
And because our neighbor gave us an idea to use an old dog run to put it over our square foot garden box that was old and weedy and we put it over it. Now the deer can't get into it. We just weeded it. And this morning we just planted some vegetables and a little bit of flowers. And I, I can't even express to you how amazing that is and how much I've enjoyed it. That's what you're saying, Lamira. that shift of lens where I know my purpose right now is to connect with my children in loving ways and in slower, more meaningful ways, not just pound it, pound it, pound it. So that is a purpose. And that may take skills. I'm learning skills of gardening that I don't like. That I'm learning what it takes to water and what kind of soil and what kind of tomatoes. Do you know how many tomato plants are out there? Help. Like, why can't we just have three to choose from? And we call it good. But anyway, so I just want you to know, I totally hear what you're saying. I get that and I feel that. But when we shift our lens to a purpose-filled lens, everything shifts. So I love that. Anybody else want to share? Annette, did you want to share love? You know, just let me share quickly. I remember being at women's conference when Sister Nelson gave this, this, uh, this talk. It, this, it was amazing just to feel, just to be there and feel it. But I remember, you know, understanding at a deeper level that, you know, I am here at this time for a specific reason. And and those reasons change. I mean, you're you guys are a lot of you're talking about you know your children and your young family at home, and you know I had my children young, and then they're gone, and it's a different phase of life. But I also see when it says we need to be prepared. You know, there's a phrase in my patriarchal blessing I got, you know, 30 years ago, that I never understood what it meant or how it would happen but I'm seeing it today. But it took preparation and work all along to be where I'm at now, to be feeling like I can fulfill my mission. Not that I know how to fulfill it or that I have it down perfectly, but I'm, I, I'm learning to listen and act and feel like I'm heading in the right direction. I love Does that. that. Make sense? Absolutely. And do we it's oftentimes don't realize how he has prepared us that all of those experiences that were hard or good or difficult or confusing, that it actually was breadcrumbing us to where we needed to get. I love that. Tara Lee, do you want to share love? Yeah, I actually was watching something this morning um, that reminded me about the parable of the 10 virgins. And I thought how perfectly this goes along with that. You know, at one point she talks about uh, being with Sherry and and how grateful she she was the grateful recipient of of those drops of oil that Sherry had been placing for those years that helped her get through that initial experience that she had at the beginning of the talk and I think that's that's the key um, is being able to do those step by step drop by drop but do them and keep them so that we have that oil to fall back on when we need it. I love that. Was that a huge piece that stood out to you guys? The power of a stalwart friend? It just, it teared me up. I loved, sorry, I loved, as you go through, if you look on page two where she, she says, the Lord honored Sherry's prayer of faith. Remember how specifically she prayed. She dropped to the sidewalk, she prayed for specifics with power, with confidence that her covenant keeping life would be able to help her claim those blessings. And she did not doubt. And then look at the words that she says. When the EMT said to transport her, Sher Sherry instantly intervened, no, I'm taking her home. As I was reading this, did you feel this? Like what would I have done in that situation? I would have trusted somebody else because they had authority, which is what we women do instead of trusting the spirit. That she said, no, I'm taking her home. And then she said with the, the Neosporin, she said, I'll never know how big that was because she never let me see the wound. Do you remember what the nurse said later? Sherry was the right person because as a nurse, I would have said, look how big that hole is. Would that have been helpful for her at all? No. And then she said, um, when she was talking about, oh, I should go and see a dermatologist sometime this week. Still no clue how serious this is, which is a good thing. And Sherry's response was careful. 
oh, you know, after all you've been through, you probably won't feel like going to church today. How many of us would be like a diehard? No, I should go to church and I feel fine and I could just go, right? But Sherry was inspired. She was wise. She had asked for that help and she was listening. She was paying attention and she was saying, I'm going to do it the way the situation needs for it to be done. Not a pharisaical cookie cutter. Just like the spiritual capacity where Michelle Craig talked about her um, great, great grandpa that got up in the roof. Remember for that, for that man, it was out of the box, out of the box thinking, but he was inspired and he went with it. And then when she says in here, um, she said all of this, the next page, page three, she said, she called the dermatologist, got them ready when they got off the plane. She said all of this very matter of factly. And then, however, the surgery did not take place until after at the instigation of Sherry, I received a priesthood blessing. This woman, what a powerhouse. She knew exactly how to be there for her friend. That is the kind of friend I want to be. I read this and I think I want to be that right person. I want to know what to say and know what to do, not for any pressure on myself, but know that in the moment I can claim that covenant power and I know that God will give me the divine downloads. Anybody else had an experience where someone was the right person for them, where they felt what this was like, that feeling of they were right there, said the right thing, or did the right thing at the right time? Anybody want to share anything else that you saw? I just loved that friendship. I have friends that we have been friends for 30 years. Another friend we've been friends for 27 years. And I am just so grateful. They are those women, those women of substance that I know that in a situation I could turn to them and say, I need you to pray for me. And I know they could pray with power. That, that's the kind of friend I want to be. Love, love, love this. From Nicholson, a huge struggle that I have been resisting in my life is something that I do know I agreed to before coming to earth. I appreciated the reminder that I agree to it and I will be given the skills and understanding to deal with it and grow from it. Yes. And don't we need that reminder? Because we feel so like, how do I even start? Where do I begin? How is it that it's me? Why not her? But he wants us to grow and he knows the seed, the packet of seeds he's planted within us. And it's up to us to dig in the dirt and weed out the four by four box and get the new soil and plant it and figure out how much we're supposed to water it, even though it's super annoying. Not that I'm coming from personal experience this morning. I love how Sherry knew not, knew not to show Wendy the wound. She handed everything so perfectly from Janaki. I have loved seeing my mom step up and into her own purpose during this time too. She is moving to fulfill her, sorry, it just scooted up, to fulfill her own blessing promise. We can be that at any stage, whatever age you are, a mother is a hub. She is a powerhouse. And we have that ability to show by how we do this to help others to see how they can do that too. I love it. From Chelsea, one thing that really stood out to me was that consecration is key to fulfilling our missions once we've found them. Something consecrated is dedicated to God and thus sacred. I love that. And we can consecrate any time. And it doesn't mean we have to do this huge, I consecrate a child, right? Like Hannah. Although maybe we want to at some times, right? But I'm just saying, we don't have to do this huge consecration. We can take a small piece. I'm going to consecrate from 6.30 to 7 in the morning for him. And I'm just going to have that scripture time for him. I'm just going to consecrate 30 minutes at night. And I'm going to go on a walk. And I'm going to have an emotional mental prayer with him while I walk. And then I'm getting a two for one. I'm being healthy so I have energy to fulfill my mission, and I'm also having that quiet time with him, whatever that is. But as we consecrate it, I find in my life, and you probably have found this too, I'm more likely to fulfill that goal if it's consecrated. Once again, going back to that Dr. Susan Madsen podcast where we feel if it's a calling as women, we are more likely to fulfill that. If we feel it is related to that calling, like I want to get in shape so that I have energy to fulfill my calling then we will do that more than I really should lose 20 pounds, right? So if we have this higher divine download purpose, we're going to be more willing to learn the skills we need to, to make that thing happen. I love that. Jane, I have that kind of friend you were talking about. We've been best of friends for 50 years. Ooh, love that. And ladies, I would bet cookies to a donut. We all have a friend like that. 
But what happens, I think, as women is because our lives are so busy, do you ever find that you're kind of like, I call myself the leftover friend because I'm horrible. I'll be like, oh yeah, it was your birthday two months ago. Okay, I'll take you to lunch now, right? It's lame. But they're the dearest, dearest friends and they're dear because they don't know about it, right? You all have friends like that where you're just like, we just connect and it's all good. But those are ones that we can go out, we can do a little nourishing. Yeah, the garden theme is going to be all throughout today, apparently. But that we can go in, we can add some water and some sunlight. We can stop by, we can text, we can give them a little something that says, you know what? You are that kind of friend to me. Read this talk. I want you to know you're my Sherry Do. Just want you to know that. Thank you. So I invite you, text, email, talk to, say something to someone that tells them, you're that friend for me. Thank you. You've saved my bacon. I love this. I agree. When I consecrate my clean house to the Lord, it feels so different. Yes. Women need women. We are stronger together, says Mary. Absolutely. And we accomplish more and we do it more joyfully and we do it more effectively when we do it together. That's why Relief Society is the underused weapon. I'm sorry. It just is. My dream in life is to kind of overhaul the whole feeling about Relief Society. It is not for us to sit for an hour and endure happy seminary answer questions and answers. It's for us to get in and get meaty and talk and share and connect. And if you've been a part of a Relief Society like that, you know what I'm talking about. You walk away from there like nourished for the next week where you've got tools and you've got energy and you've got spiritual power and it's fabulous. Consecrated, that is the third time I've heard that this year and it resonates so much. Ooh, it's a sign, Olia. Jerusha, that's so true, Mary. Sister Hinckley said it's scientifically proven that women need women. And if you read her book, Glimpses, if you haven't read it, it's darling. It's delightful. It's so fabulous. But that's where she talks about walking arm in arm. In fact, in my, this is not a shameless plug, in my um, Motherhood Matters book, I put the whole, um, hang on, let me find it. I put her whole little um, poem. Do you guys remember that poem that she read? Oh, it's worth reading. She says, I don't want to drive up to the pearly gates in a shiny sports car wearing beautifully tailored clothes, my hair expertly coiffed and with long, perfectly manicured fingernails. I want to drive up in a station wagon that has mud on the wheels from taking kids to scout camp. I want to be there with a smudge of peanut butter on my shirt from making sandwiches for a sick neighbor's children. I want to be there for a little dirt under my fingernails. I've got it from gardening this morning. Sorry. Okay from helping to weed someone's garden. I wanna be there with children's sticky kisses on my cheeks and the tears of a friend on my shoulder. And I want the Lord to know I was really here and that I really lived. So if you feel like, yeah, my house is lived in, my car is lived in. If you're feeling like it's lived in, sweet, because that's our marks. I feel like that's what we bring to the savior. He has his marks and we will bring our marks, our stretch marks our grubby hands and stubby fingernails, and we bring our marks. Not to say that we can't look our best, of course, but we will bring those, and I'm proud of those. I want to show him. These are my wrinkles. This is from this child right here. I want to show him. I have these because I really lived. Love it. I actually called my friend this morning, and we discussed this talk. It was a great exchange of thoughts, ideas, and results. Ooh, love that. Yes, it's actually balanced, but I think they could work together. Yes, we balance one another. And especially when we come in with an open mind of not getting offended or not imagining something there that's being said that's not, or if something is being said, being able to call it and go, did you just, did you just insult me? Did you just, I'm super offended. And you can banter about it. I personally love those kind of women. When I could just go, did you, what? Eh, bring it, bring it. And you can just be funny about it, right? But you have to be careful who you do that with because it may not work. Yes, Melanie. I just want to tell you, I've been, I received the biggest answer to prayer for years ago, uh, probably four years ago. I had an answer that I was to bring hope and light to God's children. And I thought, oh, that's great. And then you're like, that's broad. And I don't know what that means. Okay, I'll work on getting hope and light myself and work on that. But anyway, and then the beginning of this year, my word was actualize. It came to me very, very gently that I know enough to do enough. It was from President Nelson saying, be better, do better. And I love that. So it's on my screen. It's everywhere. So I've got actualize. And then the other thing that had been coming to me, and I think I needed to receive these first. It wasn't that they weren't there. It's like I wasn't ready to receive them. And that's okay. But um, it came to me so much that I have 
things aren't bad. I got to stop being surprised by everything in life. Like God's not surprised by any of this. And to be God, like I need to stop being surprised by everything that's happening. And that, you know, yeah, you're not going to miss a pandemic. You're not going to miss an earthquake. You're not going to miss a tornado, but you certainly will miss the miracles. And if you're not standing where you should be standing, doing what you should be doing and keeping an eye for it, you will miss those miracles and all the blessings of them. And they are going to be great. But that um, I realized how stifled I was. I was the, the fruits of how I was feeling were more evident than my conscious was, how stressed I'd been that I was anxious, that it was taking me longer to go to sleep, that I was waking up in the night, the girl usually I hit the pillow and out, so I knew there was something different. And, um, and I realized how I wasn't feeling free. And then I realized that my savior is the source of all my freedom. And um, through a series of things that happened over three days, it was a pretty intense little journey. Um, I finally received my uh, next step in my purpose, and that is that I am to give help, support, freedom. And, then, and as I said in Isaiah 11 about the tribe of Ephraim and how they're supposed to gather and all this, and I was thinking about how people can't gather if they're depressed and anxious. People can't gather if they are burdened by everything, every burden. And that's what the Savior does is free us from our burdens. And so I thought, hey, that's my next step is learning how to help people be free of their burdens. And those friendships we're talking about, that's where it starts. The Relief Society Sisterhood, that's where it starts. It's the people within our reach and helping them to feel free. Because when you free a strong woman of God, you're freeing so many more because they connect with everyone and they all are ready and closer to step into their purpose. And everyone deserves freedom. And whether it's this life or the next life, <clears throat> that they can be that much closer to moving towards their Savior and coming unto Him. So, anyway, it was a tender mercy from God to receive that. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I know Anita had a, was with a group of women for all nationally that were, weren't they about freedom? Something like that, Anita? Yeah, it was um, as a mom, a sisterhood of mommy patriots. So it was helping women become educated about political responsibility. It's a lot of education about how do you get involved, setting up mentorships for people who wanted to run for office. Uh, women, connecting them with other women who had run and, and won, and then stepping up and making a difference, speaking out to our elected representatives with solutions to problems. That's like that. fabulous. You two should connect. I know Bobby Jager, she does a lot with moms and lobbying for them in DC. She's out of Oregon, and you can, if you want to connect with me about her information. Ladies, this is how it happens. It's grassroots all the way with women, right? That's, we get concerned mamas, and then things start to shift. And it's a thing of beauty when we get in and we say, I can make a difference and I can have a little part. Reading up on things, this whole thing of women running for office is huge right now. Have you seen so much of it in Facebook and, and social media and the news? In BYU Magazine, there is a fantastic article of women speak up and speak out. And they, it's all these studies. If you get a second to get that BYU Magazine article, it is phenomenal that they just came off of, did you see that revamp? They come off of all this research of what happens to women and how things need to have women in order for them to really function fully and in order for them to function well at their best. But what happens is when women get into a situation, they notice in studies that women, especially if they are by themselves, they are talked over, they are interrupted, they are demeaned, and oftentimes not intentionally. Like this isn't just malicious men mowing down women at all. There's just men have a way of playing the game and they play it and they're not thinking, is everybody okay? Does everybody get a trophy? They're not thinking that way, but we think that way. And until we feel we're invited, we hang back. But that is not what we're to do in this day and age. Again, we do it in our feminine influence way, but we are not to hang back. We are to step up to the table and sit at that table and contribute at that table in whatever way and form it looks like. And you'll see lots of talks from the leaders of the church, men and women leaders, who are talking about this women, speak up and speak out and get your voice on because it will not work without us. It won't work. And that's what we need is that confidence, that peace of moving forward and saying, yes, we're going to do that. I love this. Um, I am part of a Covenant Keepers text group. We've been doing it for four years. Love this. We're going to talk next week a lot about covenant keeping and the power from that. And the talks that we study for next week are going to talk about that because once we get some ideas of traits and abilities that we need, 
then we need to talk about and uh, focus on how we get the power from our covenants to be able to do that. So that'll be exciting. Jerusha, one of my daughters was teasing the other and said, mom, why don't we just admit that she's adopted? No, I said, I didn't get these stretch marks because I'm a bino zebra. They're an awesome reminder that she's not adopted. You want to see? And the teasing stopped. Love that. Not the most virtual, but I love the marks. You're exactly right. I love being able to say, yes, I've been a mother of seven. Some days I love it more than others. Okay, just being honest. But I'm not changing them for that reason. I know I have lived and I love that. Men think and act through power. Women work and act through influence. Absolutely. And that's why when you have a wonderful man of God, when he understands that meekness is the, the key and the core to accessing that priesthood power, it is a beautiful, incredible, mighty thing to see for men and women being able to come into that power and come into that on their own. I just love that with God. So beautiful. So beautiful. And I know you probably can think very easily of wonderful examples in your life of good men and women who appropriately access and use that priesthood power that we all have access to being willing and worthy. I love it. Anybody else want to share? You can raise your hand. You can just unmute. Anybody else want to share something they learned from this talk or anything, comment on anything we've already commented on? Susan, did you want to, or were you just moving your camera? I'm thinking maybe you're just moving the camera. Yeah, if you make any movement, I'm going to be on it. I just don't want to take all the time with me talking, so I would love for you to share. I wanted to bring up a few points, so if you want to share other points, feel free, or if you want to piggyback on some of these, would love it. Ruthann, I have a definition I wrote a while ago for the word sacrifice that I think fits consecrate as well. It's sacrifice, sacred making, to make holy by holy means, meaning that not only the outcome, but the process as well. Follow eternal principles to culminate in the creation of eternal joy. Oh, I love that. Sometimes I wonder if that's why there's ritual attached to ordinances. Do you know what I'm saying? That when we have that, you know, the Jewish culture has survived for over 2,000 years because of the rituals that they have. And when you think about the rituals we have, what happens when we partake of the sacrament? We have a sacrament hymn. We have the cloth is covering the bread and the water. There's not a lot of ritual, but there's ritual. There's predictable patterns that we do to get us prepared to receive that ordinance. And that's why that's so important. I don't know about anybody else's experience, but with this sacrament experience, of we have neighbors that would they come up or we go down to their house and it's the simplicity is stunning. It's, it's simple, it's focused, and the spirit is just in abundance. I am going to personally miss this after we go back to regular church. And yes, there's bonuses and wonderful things about that too. But this overwhelming oof of the spirit that comes in every single Sunday that I'm partaking the sacrament this way is amazing. My son's getting baptized in June. And guess what? Usually it's about an hour, maybe an hour and a half, depending on how you run it, right? It's about a 10 minute, almost like a drive-in. Like you go, you get dunked, not trying to be blasphemous and you're out. Like that's how it sounded when they were first talking to me. And I'm like, wow. But then as I thought through it, I went, this is going to be like the sacrament. We're going to go in and focus on what? The ordinance, the sacredness of it and what that means and we're going to be able to go in and feel it and pay attention. There won't be all this talking and chattering and, and all this wah that happens with it. So I'm excited that we get to focus on these things more. I love that. That's beautiful, sweetie. Jane, something that jumped out to me was obedience and consecration. We know those are the two keys. Think temple. Obedience is the key to finding our mission. Consecration is the key to fulfilling our mission. Once we find them, I testify this is true and it works. Beautifully put. Those two are absolutely key. And that's what we're talking about, being willing and worthy. Once we're worthy, then we jump in and we are willing to do whatever he's asked us to do. And when we have those two W's, when we have obedience and consecration, miracles, we can be conduits for miracles. I've seen that and so have you. Jerusha, the rituals show honor, respect, and obedience to God. They're an act of faith. Love that. And even just like, yeah, we're at home, but I still put on a dress and my sacrifice, okay, roll the eyes, is putting on mascara. Okay, I don't have to, but I put on mascara and I hate putting on mascara. I don't unless I'm going out, but
But you know, it's these little rituals, these little sacrifices, these little things that we say, this matters. This is consecrated. This is set apart. This is different. Then it makes us pay attention. It makes us participate differently. Love, love, love. Anybody else? Yes, Mary. Oh, Dana, and then Dana after you, love, and sorry. Okay. Time. I get the getting dressed up, making Sunday special and stuff, but I, and we do that, but I also think that we're, gonna, we're coming into a time, I feel like this is the first place that we're, or that we're receiving. And at the same time, we're going to be at a time where it just doesn't matter that you're in flip-flops and, and everything. But my friend, she just absolutely refuses. And the sacrament table has to be done with white lace. And she's just all about this. But I think, I think that the worldwide fast we went through and everything was great but i it didn't take away the plague or, or the pandemic but i think heavenly father has more to teach us and it is spending more time with our family it is getting to know each other more and stuff and i think we just need to be simple just like they wore 200 years ago with their 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 set of clothes that they did have to go to church and stuff i think i think we've gotten just too far and heavenly father's trying to push us back and realize what we're really supposed to be focusing on and that is love and family i love it i love have you felt that this simplicity this culling out of things that don't matter and getting to the nubs those spiritual emotional physical nubs of what really is core for me in my life I've been feeling that of, like I said, living a beautiful life. I just love that we have this time. It is such a gift, such a gift to have this time. And we may need three more months. We may need another year. I know Harvard said that I believe they're, they're already planning on their classes all online till next January. That Germany and Spain have opened up, but then, and some people have told me that they've already started to, they've seen a spike and they're starting to close back down. I don't know for sure, but I'm hearing these different things and I'm thinking, wow, we know that this is just a first phase and that there's a lot, like you said, a lot for us to learn. Dana, go ahead, sweetie. Okay, just okay. The things, you brought this out on the front page um, from Sister Nelson, but um, the scripture in Daniel, and I just changed it and I said, oh, Dana, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. And then on the very last page, her second um, paragraph down, the Lord, I changed it to personalize it. And so I just said, the Lord knows me. He loves me. He believes in me. And he is counting on me as, as it goes on. And so I, I've liked reading that over and over as I personalized it. And I totally loved what she did with the ninth article of faith. Um, yes. That's the very last paragraph of her talk. Yes. I love that. I love how you have likened it and you have personalized it in all those places. And that's a beautiful idea. Love that. So powerful. I love this. And um, from, from anybody else, I know there was another one. Teresa, were you, did you have a hand up? Yeah, I did. Um, <clears throat> so when I was reading through and, and she was talking about how Sherry Dew was the right friend to be there with her. And um, that just really, you know, hit me. You know, what if she, she's like, what if I've been with someone who said, Wendy, I'll pray, but I've been meaning to repent of some things. And I've been meaning to spend more time in the scriptures. And I've been meaning to, you know, really practice, you know, my spiritual. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I don't want to be that person. And, and I was terrified that maybe I am that person. And then as I was reading that, the spirit reminded me of the miracles that I've experienced the last couple of weeks with um, going to school and, and the struggle that I've had doing this, this doctorate program. And finally, last night when I went to bed at 3 a.m. because I turned in my paper at two, um, I was, instead of being tired, I was elated. I was so elated and I thought, I, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. 
this is, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I finally have this confidence that I've been, that I've been just seeking for. And I mean, I'm taking this really hard class and I'm doing great in it. <laughs> and I turned in that paper and I'm not worried. I'm not worried. I have one more assignment to do that I got to turn in next week. I'm not worried because he's with me and I don't, it, and it doesn't mean I have to be perfect in, as I study my scriptures and pray. It just means to remember and, you know, um, and not, <clears throat> and not let it get away from me. You know, if I, if I miss my scripture study in the morning, I know I can, I can pick it up later that day. I make sure that I, that I schedule a time to do that. And, and, and the blessings are just real and amazing. And, and, um, and, and it's just, it's just so, it's so liberating to turn everything over to him and know that I can do this really hard doctorate program because the Lord is with me. He's called me to this and he has a purpose for me in the future. I don't know what it's going to look like, but he's got a purpose for me and he's blessed me in so many ways. And my life is nothing like I planned it would be nothing, but I'm so, so blessed. And I can't help, but just, you know, I don't I just, everything I have is because of him. Everything. There's nothing I have that isn't from the Lord. Nothing. Everything's from him. And, and when I pray, I'm like, how do I thank you for every individual thing? Because it's all from you. Just thank you for everything. Like everything I look at is because of him. And I just can't. Anyway, sorry. I just is that, No, that's so beautiful. And isn't that when we feel that, like you said, that elation, we, we've talked about when we are finding, trying to find our purpose and it's a, it's a path and a maze and we're trying to find the breadcrumbs and we're trying to get it. And then we think this is the right thing. We're not sure. Okay. We're going to try it. But we always, as women, we tend to have this self doubt, right? This doubt, whether it's the right thing to do or this doubt about ourselves being able to do it. And then you have those assurances that two in the morning assurance you turn in the paper and the spirit confirms to you, great job. You did, mm -hmm. you did what you were supposed to do. That's when we can add those to our journal, to our bucket list fulfillment, where we say, I'm going to hold on to that. I'm going to hold on to that to the next time that I start doubting myself. I'm going to remember that last one. I was just doing an interview with Josie Kilpack. If anybody reads her books, she does Regency and she's done the Sadie series with the culinary um, art series. Can't remember the one of that. But anyway, I was interviewing her yesterday and she said, Every, she's written 30 books, every single book. I've come to a place where I say, why am I even doing this? I am a horrible writer. I, it was a fluke. I don't have another one in me. This is ridiculous. I can't even submit this. I mean, literally, like you said in here, Janaki, the doubt is real. And it comes to us in these waves. And especially when they're unexpected, but expect them, expect them to come. And then we can go back to our journal where I encourage you to write those tender mercies, or write those assurances, maybe just have one journal. And she said she keeps a journal just for spiritual experiences because she said, I don't have very many. She said, the way that I'm wired, the way that I think, I don't have a lot of woo spiritual experiences. But when he gives me those assurances, I write them down so that when I forget, I go back and I read those and I remember I'm on the right path. So that is such a huge piece. Love this. And I love the comments on the side that you're encouraging and being kind. And I love someone is saying that their teenage daughters are in the kitchen and, and they're making comments and they're talking about this too. Women, that's what we're to do. We're to, to share this with our, especially our daughters, but our boys too, but especially our daughters who need more of that confidence push, push to be able to go, whoosh, you can do this. You can make this happen. And I'm, I'm scared to death, but I'm doing it too. I'm, I'm being an example of that. I love it. Anybody else want to make a comment on what they learned? And then we're going to go to a plea to my sisters, but kind of last comment on this, this beautiful, powerful, beady talk that you could read probably 10 times and still get more out of it. I just love the part that said, we're going to find ourselves increasingly out of step with the world. And that in fact, probably an early clue that there's something not quite right in our lives is, is if we're feeling a little comfortable with the world. And I definitely feel that, you know, I, 
especially not living in Utah, living in South Dakota, my life looks very different. Just, you know, my husband's group every month, they have an after hours, uh, bring your spouse time to go to the bar. And we, our life just looks very different from that. And <clears throat> as a parent to the kids in my home, my parenting looks different than um, other parenting as far as what we permit and trying to convey that to children. So I, I like that. Just something to help us, it's a check, it's a checkpoint. If we oh don't feel comfortable, then maybe we're not where we need to be. I love that, that checkpoint. Do you ever feel that you need that? Like, am I on the straight and narrow? Cause it's kind of broad on the straight and narrow. There's a lot of different ways we can go. And a lot of, I mean, in the sense of with the gospel, you know, guardrails, we, we've got a lot of options of what we can do. And we've been told in conference talks, women do not need 12, 14, 16 kind of ordinances in that sense. We just are able to go to the temple. So he's telling us, I'm trusting you. I give you your agency your your covenant women then get on your knees and go for it figure it out bring me your 16 stones and i'll make it better or i'll give you a different direction but do do something even if it's a small something even if it's being still make it a conscious choice of what you're going to go from here love that i wanted to just bring up really quickly because this was a really powerful thing do you remember where she talked about the three stories of the women was anybody else just blown away by those the, the prayer, the power of prayer, that woman in an abusive marriage and the power of prayer. And note that she also was going to a therapist at the time who obviously it sounded to me like was um, either it was Wendy or someone, but she was getting help because when she finally reached out for help, there was only one other friend and her mom that believed her. Anybody had that experience in your life, whether through a friend or your own experience and abuse is just rampant in this day and age, whether it's our own experience or a friend's. And I loved that she was like, they learned to pray. In any event, these three women learned to pray with power, to access, access protection and direction from the Lord. And I love that. He was even stopped in his tracks. I want you to think about the power of your prayer for yourself, for your children, for your community. The power of a woman's prayer and a mother's prayer is not to be gainsaid. So I want you to focus on that for just, if you get a minute this week, just pause and think about the power of prayer that comes from a woman. And, and notice the power of prayer in scriptures. Hannah, for different women, the, the prayers that they gave and what they did in those prayers. And just like a Sherry do, the specific, that they, they went with it, they did something about it and they had full confidence, but that the, the access, the power was gonna be there, just like Teresa talked about. The adoption part spoke personally to me and reminded me of how I could physically feel the Lord's hand in bringing my two youngest children to our family. One of my children, according to laws, should not be with us. Isn't that powerful? Adoption stories are incredible to me. People for the power of prayers. When I didn't have, sorry, the faith that my prayers would be answered. Yes. And then we keep praying. We keep watering that plant, wondering if it's actually going to produce fruit before the deer get it. But we're going to keep praying, right? We're just going to keep praying and we're going to pray with power which is different. I know the difference in my prayers when I'm just hitting the floor because I'm exhausted and I'm saying a prayer and then I'm getting in bed. And I know when I am kneeling and asking in a prayer of faith, calling down the powers of heaven. So consider that. I thought those were perfect. And then she said, may I suggest that some of the most heart-wrenching, discouraging events in our lives from which we long to be set free are actually designed to prepare us with the very skills and understanding the Lord needs us to have. There's the bookends. Look for in the experience that we're having right now or experiences that we've had before, how he has prepared us with the very skill and understanding that we likely need to fulfill our purpose. The very thing we don't want to probably talk about or face or deal with is the very thing that's part of our purpose. When I look back and I think, you know, if I was in pre-mortality and I went to Heavenly Father and said, I want to help women and families, what's the best experiences for me to have when I go down to earth? And if he would have said, well, I want you to have this. I want you to have a child that has Asperger's. I want you to have seven children because you know you don't really want to have a big old family and you're going to move to three different countries and you're going to have a miscarriage and you're going to have abusive situations you're in with, as a child and in marriage. You're going to have all of these things. I'm sure I wouldn't have jumped for joy, but I know my uber, uber, uber zealous self would have said, perfect. 
I'll have a total tool belt to help women. It'll rock, it'll be awesome. Some things I'd like to say to my pre-mortal self, that's a post right there. But anyway, I think about that. Doesn't it make sense to you? If you start feeling something toward a purpose that you want to do, doesn't it make sense? The experiences that you're having or have right now or have had, then we can see it through that lens that Lamaya was talking about. Oh, wait a second. That's a purpose-filled lens. I get that now. I'm grateful for that because it's given me compassion and understanding. So I love that. She talks about this urgency that we're feeling. And then she says, as any and consecration is key to fulfilling our missions, like we had just talked about, the only way I know to do what we've come here to do, to live up to who we are and to worthily fulfill our pre-mortal commitment is to consecrate all that we have and all that we are to the Lord. That means putting him and his work first. That means developing our gifts and talents to build up his kingdom rather than our own. That means giving him even our will. And then she says, what do you think is going to happen if we do that? If we would look at every ability and every talent and every challenge and grueling obstacle as being given to us for such a time as this. And this is when I do speaking. I talk about for him. Whatever you do, if you're not sure, tack on the end for him. I garden for him. I bathe my children. I take care of my children. I feed my children for him. I do photography for him. I write for him. If you tack on for him, I can promise you it will shift that lens by a few degrees. It will shift it to that purpose-filled lens. And there is that new way of seeing it that can change everything. Love, 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 love. I think we said yes because we were committed, but we didn't know what it would feel like. Oh yeah, we didn't really know what we're getting it. To. Come on. Like, and I even Elder um, Holland said that the savior, how could he have known exactly how sin felt, felt because he'd never felt it. It's one thing to read about it. It's one thing to hear about it and know about it. It's another thing to go through it. And even he likely did not know how awful it was truly going to feel and be. And I'm glad. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we don't know? As she, when I interviewed Josie yesterday, she said a really profound comment, if I can try to remember it. She said, I'm glad that I didn't know the ending because I might not have gone through the whole thing to get the result. Isn't that powerful? Aren't we glad we don't know any more about what's coming? We know the ultimate ending. We're going to be supernal and glorious and triumphant. But aren't we glad that we really don't know what's really down around the corner? Because we won't remember that there's a blessing packet that comes with it. A friend of mine found out her sweet son has MD. This isn't the first trial of that magnitude she's faced with her family or her life. She looked at me and said, do you think we'll ever be normal or easy? I said, I don't think we got in the line for easy. Where was that line? Was that the express? We had 15 items. We were like, I can't go in that one. Uh, I don't think we got, we got in the line for challenges and said, bring it. I've got this. And well, on my good days, don't you feel on your good days? You're like, move over. Like that quote about Sherry Dew when someone said to her, I think that when you wake up, Satan says, oh no, she's awake, right? Every day. That's how I want to be. I wish I could remember how I felt when I signed up for that. I was clearly confident. I know we were, and we can get back to that. It's still in there. All right, let's move from this one. Thank you so much. I love these beautiful comments. Absolutely gorgeous talk. Encourage you to do this with friends, do a text group on it, do something more with it. Absolutely love it. I'm going to show you the download because as we go to a plea to my sisters, I want you to be able to see it. And then you can get an idea of what we're talking about. Let me share the screen here. This is the download for today. Can you guys see that? Let me know if you can. So it has clarify and define. So we took that brainstorm of Venn diagram for a couple of weeks ago. And this is an easy way to sort of sort it. You can do put those traits and qualities and abilities and all of those wonderful things and put them in these three concentric circle in my life. I like to think of it as a concentric circle, but I did it in rectangles here just to make it easier. But there's self. Remember the savior went to the mount and got himself set. And then the multitude came to him. So self, relationships, and life skills. So self is, you know, I want to be vibrant and energetic and I want to be well-read and I want to know how to, to um, listen to myself and trust God and all of those things, those spiritual, emotional things. Then relationships, that's, I have a voice and I know how to use it. I set healthy and appropriate boundaries. 
I know how to ask for what I want and I know how to compromise and when. That's relationships. I know how to be respected and I know how to require that respect. And then life skills. That's how to organize my time and space, how to balance my budget, how to wisely use my finances, how to get a skill, how to do a resume, how to be able to get a job, how to do a job that's fulfilling, how to find or create one that helps me help other people. That's a life skill. So I want you, when you have a chance, if you can look through some of these things of a plea to my sisters or the things you wrote down for the Venn diagram, plug them into the self relationships and life skills. And this will give you kind of a snapshot of the things that you want to do and become. And that gives you a starting place of where God wants you to begin for your personal purpose and how to find it and fulfill it. And then just to get you a little easy start is this purpose who statement. I am, and we do an I am of who I am and what I'm to do. So you can choose one word from each of those columns to say I am. And remember the importance of I am in the Old Testament and throughout. It's in our, our young women theme now, the I am a daughter of God. And in fact, I have, oh, it's in my scriptures right now, but with a divine destiny, right? A, a daughter of beloved heavenly parents with a divine destiny and eternal nature, divine destiny, eternal nature. So we can have this I am statement that kind of is a specific to us and what we're doing right now. I am spiritually grounded, connected, and organized. Those are the three words maybe that can define you, one from each of those columns. So have some fun playing around with this, with choosing three words to start with that really resonate with you. In the programs that I do, we go very deep. So if anybody's done a program, you know this is a super just very top layer frosting thing, but it's a start. It gets you a start to start thinking in the day. I am spiritually grounded and connected and I am organized. So what would a spiritually grounded, connected and organized woman do today? What would be her choices today? Because that's choosing your purpose and that's fulfilling it by the small and simple choices that we make every day. I love that thing from Sister Nelson where she does, what would a holy woman do? Anybody read her book on that? What would a holy woman do? And then she challenges women to do for 21 days to just do attend the temple one more time. But she, she proposes that question, asking herself as she goes throughout her day, what would a holy woman do? Now, not to the nth pharisaical degree of we sometimes we think being more obedient means being more stringent. And that's not true necessarily. It's maybe it's being more obedient and tidying that up, but maybe it's opening up more. Maybe it's being more loving instead of going and reading your scriptures for 25 minutes. Maybe it's going and throwing the ball with your child or just listening to your teenager rant when you'd rather not. So maybe it's, it's that kind of opening up and that kind of connection. So consider what that might look like for you. I started making a list of the skills attributes for the kind of women the Lord needs in my study of both talks. I'm excited to go through and divide it up and feel where God needs me. And I love that phrase, feel where God needs me. Some of the things that I pulled out, feel free to let me know what you got from this talk on the second pass. Some of the things that I saw, these different words, distinct, different, righteousness, articulateness, happy ways, strength, conviction, ability to lead can organize or be organized, executive ability, speak out, gift of discernment, to teach fearlessly, make important things happen, unite in governing your family. So many great things in there. So tell me on the second pass, any thoughts on a plea to my sisters that helped you maybe kind of get a better idea of maybe where you need to start with fulfilling that personal purpose, or maybe some things you need to consider simmer, kind of can think about for your own as far as moving forward and how to do that. Any thoughts that anybody had on that? Ruth Ann, I wrote another draft yesterday. I am light, called to labor in God's creation of this day, my family, and our home. Ooh, I love that. I do believe our homes are our mini world. Has anybody else felt that way? And when we say, well, we're going to create worlds without number, it starts here. And there's so much that we feel sometimes that we don't have control over, right? Depending on your situation at home. But there's so much we do. And we can be a force for good in our homes. And we can do as much as we can to create an environment for change, an environment for spiritual growth. We create the environment and then people have their agency. And we don't have to stress so much about that. 
as far as outcome parenting, we create the environment and that's what we are, are challenged with. That's what we are going to have to answer for is what kind of environment did we create? What kind of person were we in making that happen in our homes? Any other thoughts on a plea to my sisters? Angela. Okay. Oh, you're not muted. You're still muted. Okay, did I do it? There you go, perfect. Um, where he says, whatever you're calling, whatever your circumstance, we need your impressions, your insights, your inspiration. We need you to speak up and speak out in ward and state councils. So there's a little piece of that um, that I was thinking about this week. And it kind of relates to what we talked about the other last week about um, how easy it is for me to go and write down all the things I should be doing and then I forget to go back and look at look at it. So this last week I was with my family. We were doing our little come follow me and we talked about um, a leader. Who's a leader that we have felt um, has has influenced our lives for good and that we we look up to and and so and then we challenged ourselves to write a little note to that leader. So the next day, I was just kind of thinking about, thinking about it a little bit and, and realized I was getting an impression that I needed to write a little note because I wasn't, I was thinking of someone else I was going to write a note to. Anyway, I got an impression that I should send a little note to my state president. <laughs> so, so when I worked on the state council, I always felt so listened to, that my opinion was valuable, that what I had to say he would stop and listen and valued it. And I thought, I wonder if he knows that. So I just sat down and I don't write very well. So it's not my thing to like write emails, but I, I just typed up a quick little email and just expressed that to him, how much I appreciated being heard and that my opinion was valued. And, um, and I really felt that that, I kind of stopped myself a couple times to say, no, I don't need to do that. That's my state president. I don't need to worry. He's got lots of stuff on his plate. I don't need to worry about that. But I just felt that I should do that. So I just did it. And then later that day, he sent me back a little email and just said, you do not know how much that meant to hear um, that you valued that, you know, you, that, that that was important and that I felt like he was listening. And um, anyway, it was just a sweet thing. I just felt like, because I had been prayerful that day, because we talked about um, asking Heavenly Father, even if it's a simple thing like, who can I help today? Okay, that's kind of what it was. Who can I help today? That was what my impression was. I should write this note. And then I got the, I got the feeling that I should do that. And then I got this little answer that was like, that meant a lot to me that you did that. And it was an answer to my prayer. And I was able to share that with my daughter and with my son. And I felt so like, oh, oh, that was proof right there that this little thing praying to ask, who can I help today? And how it all kind of made the circle and made a difference. And it, it just kind of evolved into a couple of other things that, anyway, it was sweet. It was a sweet thing. I love that. And like you said, now it dominoes. Every time we have an experience like that, it makes us more bold and confident to answer that feeling the next time. If you've read in Women in the Priesthood, do you remember that experience that Sherry Dew shares about the, the state president that she worked with? And remember how when she came in the room, him and his counselors would stand. And then when she had a concern, he talked to all the bishops and said, this is a concern that Sister Dew and I both have, and I would like for her to share it with you at the bishops meeting and had her sit right next to the state presidency. And then when she got done, he said, I concur and agree with everything that she said. And I ask you to take what she has said and implement it. She said, I would walk over hot coals to make sure that state president's agenda was met in the state because the respect, it, it was on par. She was an equal. They were working together for the benefit of the state. Now, I know that's not always the case, but it will only shift 
if we women will keep moving forward. In Sister Ulrich's book, Live Up to Your Privileges, if you've read that one, the second half, the last third chapter, somewhere in there, it's the last several chapters, it's the ones about women. She gives some specific tips on what you can do when you're in a ward council or a men um, stacked situation where it's not us versus them. It's not like that, but understanding the mentality and the way that they think, working with that, that when you get interrupted, that you say, oh, one second, I wasn't finished. I had more to say on that, just a moment. And not apologizing all over yourself all the time, but just, oh, just a minute, thanks so much for being patient. Appreciate the opportunity to, to speak for a moment on this. It's, it's very important that we address this topic. Being able to keep jabbing in, not as a mean jab, but this is what men do. They expect that if you've got something to say, you're going to sit up and say it. They're not going to ask you for a hall pass, right? You're going to sit mm -hmm. up and you're going to say it and speak what you have to say. So I love that. Love, love, love. Jane, the Holman family is our personal school to learn those things. We will need to progress in eternity. We can and will make mistakes, but we learn much more from making the effort. Mistakes allow us to grow. That's the beauty of the Savior's Atonement. I love that because we don't have to stress that, ladies. We are going to say the wrong thing. We are going to speak up at the wrong time. We are going to do the wrong point or agenda. We are going to say the wrong thing to somebody what, that just had a horrible thing that went through and then it's going to blow up in our face. One of my friends, her husband <clears throat> called to be bishop and he was new, 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 new. First time ever. And he kind of has ADD, the nicest man, but he had gone through and had made all of their wish list for callings. And he had handed it off to the secretary guy and said, hey, can you get this sent? Well, in his way of communicating, the guy thought he meant that he wanted it printed in the Sunday announcement. So on Sunday, this wish list of the entire ward goes out. And he had nothing but the phone ringing off the hook all day. People in sense, I'm getting released as the young women president. And all, I mean, it was like, I can't even express. And you can imagine his feeling at the time, like, where's a rock that I can crawl under? Please release me now. And he's got <laughs> five years, right, ahead of him. But it all worked out, and he was ended up called twice because they moved, and he ended up being called to a bishop again. And so you just go with it. We're going to make the mistakes. We're going to think back to Joseph Smith in the 116 pages and say, I'm so glad he included that for the world to see so that I can feel better about my mistake right now. So <clears throat> I love that. I love that you shared that. Thank you, sweet Angela. Anybody else have anything they want to share as we're wrapping this up? I'm just going to um, share one last thing for the talks for next week, but anybody have any other points on a plea to my sisters and or for such a time as this, but especially a plea to my sisters. Both of these just rock my world. I love these. I go back to these over and over. These are our marching orders. And I love this. Just as bookends, we're going to go more in depth to the Spencer W. Kimball quote next week. But I love where he, he quotes this. Much of the major growth that is coming to the church in the last days will become because of many of the good women of the world. That's the good, beautiful women of the world who I have many friends who are this. And I love them. And I learn from them. In my interfaith work, I learned so much from them will be drawn to the church in large numbers because of who? The women of the church. He says, you who are vital associates during this winding up scene, the day that President Kimball foresaw is today. You are the women he foresaw. And we need women who can do these things so that you can go to God and say, here am I, send me. That's what he's looking for. When you look at the whole planet, all of the people on the planet, who are covenant keeping women who can go into a community, into a family and make change happen? How many are there? It's us. It's us, ladies. That's what we signed up for. And when we have Gideon-like forces of 300, do you remember? He kept whittling it down. 10,000 people showed up for the battle. And he said, it's too many. They're going to think they won on their own. Send them home. And it whittled and whittled and whittled and down to the 300. And they won the war, the battle with the 300. We are the Lord's 300 and we can get out there and with whatever tools he's given us, gardening tools or kitchen tools or photography tools, we can get out there with the tools he's given us and we can make it happen. And we can have more influence than we have any understanding and clue. I know that that's true. I know that because I get emails from women from five years ago, from 10 years ago saying something that you said, a talk that I went to 
something I read in your book. It changed my life and it changed my family. Is this because it's me, magical me? No, that's the influence we all have. And the domino effect of Angela sending that card to that state president and how he will continue or even increase how he recognizes women and how he is a state president. People are watching him. will now take that example and do more and more and more rock in the pond, the pebble in the pond, and that concentric circle of influence, that is ours to start and to keep moving forward in our small and simple but powerful ways. I know that that is true. Sisters, we have a marvelous work and a wonder to do, and I just love, I love, most days I love, that we signed up for this and that we are part of this and that we have this treasure trove, this tool belt, all of these things to stand like a Xena warrior and say, bring it. But maybe not provokingly, but with female feminine influence, say, bring it. Do you want some cookies with it? But bring it, right? <laughs> because we're going to make it happen. And if we have to do a little softness and we have to do a little this, we'll do it because we're going to make it happen. The talks for next week are wonderful. They are Spiritual Treasures by President Nelson. That's all about studying about women and accessing that covenant power. And then Turn On Your Light by Sister Eubank. And she, we're going to book in this because she goes into detail, if you remember, about that um, quote from Spencer W. Kimball. And it's just fabulous. I was listening again last week to that as I was walking and doing my walk. And I just wanted to shout for joy. Just so felt the downloads of that talk. So enjoy your studies and keep us, keep connected. I love seeing your posts on the Facebook group. Stay connected and keep each other moving forward, coming down to this funnel. By the time we get done with this, remember what was the one thing you wanted to accomplish from this four week class? We have one more week. What's the thing you want to accomplish by the end of next week? So make that your powerful prayers. Make that a part of your study. Get that question and give it to him and say, this is my one of my 16 stones. Really want this answered. If it's possible, by the end of this next week, I've been putting in the work and putting in the study and I've been thinking, and this is what I'm thinking is my best guess, but here's my stone. Tell me what you think and see what we come up with. Okay. Any last thoughts before we close it off? And then we'll just have a couple of minutes for an after party. If anybody has any questions, they prefer to do a little bit more privately. Hey, Connie. Yes, love. At the very end of his talk, there are a couple of things that he says about rising to your full stature and fulfilling the measure of your creation it's almost like an exclamation point be bold be daring do what that's what we've been called to do oh that just gave me goosebumps and right above it where he says step forward mm. wow i plead with you to step forward take your rightful and needful place in your home in your community and in the kingdom of god more than you ever have before and i promise you in the name of Jesus Christ, that as you do so, the Holy Ghost will magnify your influence in an unprecedented way. Mm. We live in an incredible day and age, sisters. I'm grateful to be on this journey with you. Oh, you're so cute. I just love being with you, and I love studying with you, and I love the energy that I get from this and the commitment and the covenant power that I feel. And I encourage you to take that back to your families in a way that works for you and to really need that spiritual dough this week to get what you need from what, what we're reading, okay? And then I'm going to ask you next week, but I would love to have your thoughts and opinions on what you want to do from here. After this four weeks, I have some ideas, but I would love to say, to know what you have to say and what you want to do from here and what's reasonable for us to be able to continue on in a reasonable, but um, structured, helpful, juicy, joyful way. So be thinking about that and you can post some ideas. I'm going to put that question in the group. Okay. And the name of the Facebook group is step into your purpose. So if you look on Facebook, step into your purpose, that's what it is. All right. I'm so glad for you ladies being here. I know we've had new people today and I can't believe how many have stayed on the whole time. I know that we've got family life in the background and I'm so glad. I'm hoping to get something good today. A thumbs up. Did you get something good? That's great. Thank you. Yay. That you can take back and chew on and nibble on and have some fun with. Okay. All right. I love you ladies. We'll see you next week. Study those talks and stay connected. We'll see you next week for step into your purpose.